Okay, it tells me I'm recording. Let's hope it's right. So this afternoon, morning, evening, I'm going to talk about Algerian history and postal history leading up to 1830 when the French invaded. And I'll talk a little bit, I'll end with why they did that. So without further ado, assuming I can get to the next slide here. There we go. This is a kind of a rough map of Algiers in 1579. And of course, Algeria wasn't really Algeria until after the French invaded when they assigned that name to the entire coast from Oran over to Bonn or what's now called Anaba on the north coast of, of uh, Africa. So at the time we have Algiers, which it was a walled city. And even though back in 1579, the perspective was kind of odd when they did maps, this is not a bad representation that the, the city grew up on a hillside like this. And you can also see down in the foreground, uh, just to the right of the number 1579 and above it, there is a mole where they protected their harbor by building the mole out into the harbor, uh, which of course reduced the, the waves and gave them a place to put artillery and to load and unload ships. So this is what Algiers looked like in 1579. This is, we think, the oldest piece of postal history from Algiers. It's a letter written in January, on January 4th, 1597. It's written in Italian and it's written in a Milanese dialect from what people have told me who've looked at it. And unfortunately, because of that, it's extremely difficult to translate. So I really don't know what it says. Uh, someone has said they think it's a personal letter. Somebody else said they think it's uh, perhaps a commercial letter uh, because in there it mentions Colombo, which is the Italian name of Christopher Columbus. On the other hand, it could also refer to somebody else by that same name. We just don't know. Um, but it is the oldest and to anybody's knowledge, and I will have to say it is, I think, the third time I bought the oldest letter from Algiers. <laughs> Excuse me, Ken, uh, would, yes. would you mute? Ken, would you mute everybody? There's some crosstalk. I can do that. Um, let's see. I think the easiest thing for me to do is go back to... Where is my Zoom? No, I have. I think I need to open that. No. I can't figure out how to do it now that I'm sharing my screen. So let me stop sharing my screen. I'll mute everybody and then we'll come back. Everybody, everybody's muted. And I am allowing you to unmute yourself, but please do that only when we're doing Q&A or if you have a question to ask me. And now we'll go back to screen share. Okay, so this letter came with a certificate from the Turkish Philatelic Federation, which I didn't know existed, but it doesn't surprise me that it does. And you'll see that it says it's genuine, the letter, which I was happy to see. And it's the only recorded cover. And I think by that, they mean it's the only one from Algiers to Turkey. Because when I have asked other Turkish philatelists about this, they have never seen any other letter uh, that goes from Algiers to Turkey. And it's largely because they did it by messenger rather than by actually writing something down. And let me give it, push the button over here again. Okay, so what was going on on the north coast of Africa? 
The Turks showed up in 1517. They had been poking around in the Mediterranean for centuries before that, of course. The Barbary pirates, which were now the Turks, began raiding shipping in the Mediterranean, and they used as ports for this Tripoli, uh, Tunis in Tunisia, Iran, and Algiers in Algeria. And the uh, Tripoli was the first foreign war for America after the after the Revolutionary War when they sent some Marines over there because. The Turks were raiding American shipping as well at that point, and they wanted to stop it. So being a day of Algiers, and there's some discussion about whether it's a D like dog, E-Y, or a B like boy, E-Y, but it appears that in Algiers, kind of the chief Turk was called a day, D-E-Y, and the chief Turks in the other cities were called a bay or a B-E-Y. It wasn't a good career to have. Uh, they were oftentimes assassinated. They were uh, poisoned when they didn't pay their soldiers or if shipping dried up or they made an agreement with the Europeans that the rest of the Turks didn't like. So they'd mutiny and they'd kill off the day and hold an election and appoint a new one. Uh, there was at one somewhere I read in one of the many books I've read about this, that there were four in one day because they were so unhappy with whoever it was they elected. The Europeans, to get the Turks to lay off their uh, enslavement of their people and to, to lay off pirating their ships, would pay uh, tribute to the Turks to avoid all of this. The agreements tended to not last very long. They would require annual tribute. Uh, there may have been some intentional misunderstanding of what the agreements were, but in general, uh, there was a lot, of act, a lot of diplomatic activity going on and it wasn't always very successful. If somebody was enslaved by being captured on a ship by the Turks, they could be ransomed if their relatives could raise the money and there were several times when the Europeans tried to stop this piracy in the Mediterranean and not all of them were successful. So here is another piece of postal history, 1603. And this was another of the letters that I bought as the oldest surviving letter from Algiers before I bought the one from 1597. Written in June 1603, it's, uh, I think, a commercial letter. And it is written in kind of a halfway between the medieval script and more, more, more modern cursive handwriting. But you can see uh, that it says Algiers, 13th of June 1603, inside the letter, addressed to Marseille. This is the inside of the letter. It's been eaten by bugs a little bit. Um, and I'm thinking that the discoloration is more likely seawater than it is disinfection at this point. But uh, you can see that the body of the letter is written in this medieval handwriting. Um, somebody kindly tried to pencil in the French words as they were able to read them, but it's a little too dim for me to read it. You can see that the handwriting of the signature is a little closer to modern script, modern cursive. So this is what it was like to cross the Mediterranean if you were, this happens to be a French ship that's under attack by the Barbary pirates. They like to use the ships with oars because it gave them maneuverability. And oftentimes they could close ranks to a point where the, the uh, ship being attacked really had no effective defense against the, the pirates. Here's a document from 1647 that I don't believe went through the mail doesn't appear to be folded like it would have been. You can see stitching on the left-hand side, and that actually is stitching a second letter inside the letter, and I'll show you that in a moment. This is dated July 23rd, 1647, and it's definitely not written by the same person who wrote this letter, which is sewn inside. Um, and I've highlighted here where you can see that it says it was signed in Iran, and um, it is dated in the last line as well, 
there's three at least three signatures at the bottom of the letter with a like a hand uh, seal as well a flourish i'm not i'm not sure what the subject is i've never taken the time to translate it having kind of lost interest because it's uh, not a not a letter here's the last letter the first time i bought a oldest surviving letter from algiers and I do know that there is at least one more before this one uh, that's later than the 1603 letter that I just did not purchase. But uh, this one is pretty interesting. It's written in Italian, and it's from a guy named Antonio Zaffi, who was a Christian slave in Algiers. And he's writing back to his relatives in Livorno saying, hey, ransom me out of here. I am not enjoying being a slave. And you can see the Italian on the outside of the letter which translates as this is a letter of a poor slave uh, and he's he's desperate to be ransomed out this is an, a picture of the process you see the christian monks on the right hand side presenting gold coins the turk sitting at the table and the mistreated slaves crouching in chains over on the left hand side um, there were actually, and I'll show on the next slide, I believe, there was a religious order. There may have been more than one. This one being the uh, or Our Lady of Mercy order founded in 1218. And although I, I can't read the Latin or the Spanish, whatever it is, probably Latin very well, clearly it says that this is for the redemption of Christian captives. Uh, in the headline uh, over on the right hand side there. So this pamphlet is actually from 1678 and it's describing a plague outbreak that's killed a lot of people. The pamphlet describes how they go ahead and redeem captives in Algiers. And I actually got that from the pictures I found on eBay where this was for sale although I didn't buy it because, again, it wasn't postal, but I thought it was interesting to the history of Algiers. So in 1681, the Europeans, uh, this was the French, I believe, sent a ship down to bombard Algiers. And they, yeah, it was French. And uh, they tried in 1682 to reach an agreement with the Turks to stop pirating French ships. Uh, there was no real agreement between the two sides, so they had a second uh, sortie in 1683 when they res rescued some French prisoners and they finally got the Turks to agree a, to a 100-year treaty. However, that 1683 treaty only lasted five years before one side or the other broke it, and I'm expecting it was the the Turks who returned to piracy against the French, but they did reach a new treaty in 1688, and that one was respected again for a while. Here's a Dutch map of 1695, again of Algiers, and you can see how the town is triangular shape, walled on the sides, and it climbs up the side of a hill. I don't know that it's quite tall enough to be a mountain, but uh, this is very much what we think Algiers looked like in 1695, uh, that this would be, this would truly be what it looked like sitting out on the Mediterranean on a ship. You can see the tall building in, in the uh, foreground that's also the, the building out on the end of the mole protecting the harbor. Back to postal history. This is a 1731 letter to Scotland. And it's written in English, conveniently. It describes uh, an opera or a correspondent asking if he can serve as the addressee's agent in commercial affairs for anything going on in Algiers or surrounding area. Sent via ship. I don't believe there's any postal route at the time. And you can see there's no postal markings. Uh, I can assure you there's none on the backside either. It's a very small letter. Here's the uh, 1749 map. And again, you get a little different perspective, but you still see the triangular shape climbing up the hillside 
and the mole in the foreground. So in 1775, the Spanish and the Tuscans decided they would invade Algiers in an effort to shut down the piracy. They failed spectacularly. They could, they landed their artillery and then discovered that they couldn't push it through the wet sand on the beachhead. And then they were led into a trap where a quarter of the force was killed or injured and they turned tail and left. So you can see where the city is on that map in pink. And it, I drew this from the web, so it's not a very clear uh, render, rendering of the map. And it's well fortified. We know they have that mole sticking out into the harbor. There are steep hills right at the beach. And so there was just no way that the European forces were going to succeed against the Algerians, the Turks. In 1784, this gentleman, Barcelo, oh, I say at left, he's at the right. I must have uh, moved the picture on the slide at one point. They bombarded Algiers for eight days. They really didn't get anywhere. They sailed away and the Algerians used that time to improve their fortifications because they sort of expected to get bombarded again. And in, sure enough, in 84, Barcelo and another fleet showed up for 11 days, they threw more than 20,000 cannonballs and grenades into Algiers. So finally in 1786, Spain, Algiers, and Tunisia, all or Tunis, I suppose, all reached a treaty that they would uh, no longer in, enslave Spanish Christians. And the treaty actually lasted until the Napoleonic Wars, which were uh, about 15 years later. Now we see some French mail coming, coming out. This was written July 11th, 1785. And it's addressed as a lot of these letters are to the health commission in uh, Marseille or the sanitary sanitation commission. Most of these letters talk about the health uh, problems, yellow fever, plague and cholera uh, happening in Algiers. There at this point was still no postal system. So you can see down at the lower left on the letter, it says by, by Captain, I think it's Recoset. I cannot read the handwriting very clearly, but the DLC is roughly translated as a Latin God preserve or something like that, hoping that he'll get the letter through. This is the first postal marking in what is now Algeria. It's a Spanish marking used in Oran. One of the texts says there's a black marking as well. I've never seen it, never seen it referenced anywhere else except there. But Oran was conquered by Spain in 1509. And if you remember, I said that the Turks showed up in 1517. So the Spanish were there first in North Africa. However, the day of Algiers retook Oran in 1708 during the War of Spanish Succession, but Spain came back in 1732 and reconquered Oran and Algiers and the area in between. But there was a big earthquake in 1790 and Spain finally just gave up in 1792 after the earthquake. So here's the letter. I have, you can see it's written in Iran on January 27th in 1788. I have sat with a friend who, who knows Spanish very well, and he claims not to be able to read this crazy, beautiful handwriting. But I keep saying I can pick out words and I don't read Spanish. So I'm surprised that he tells me he can't tell what it's about. But we did read enough of it that he thinks it's a commercial letter and it's written from Francisco Bosch in Oran, you can see who signed it, and he's addressed it to Vicente Bosch in Tassa. So we think it's brother to brother um, and would likely contain some family information and probably some commercial information as well. But I love the script. In 1795, I have a letter written by the Bay of Oran in French, and it's a commercial letter talking about commercial business between the Bay of Oran and actually somebody he addresses as Bay Mohammed of the African agency at Marseille. 
So despite the Bey Mohammed in Marseille having no real political power, uh, he still carried a title as being the head of the, the uh, Arab business venture, whatever it might have been, warehousing or commercial traffic of some kind in Marseille. I did note that the date is the 18th of June. It's not using the revolutionary calendar. Uh, you can see that down at the bottom. And here's just uh, uh, close-ups of the opening of the letter, the addressee, and the signature of, the, of Muhammad, who really just applied his seal. I, I expect he was not able to write French. Here's the first postal marking used in Al Algiers. And it's, again, a Spanish marking. Their, their name for the town is Argel. They occupied Algiers in 1302, but didn't really consider it a serious occupation until 1510. The Turks forced them out for the last time in 1529. Here in 1799, they don't really control Algiers, but they've obviously got enough going on that there's a postal service there available. And it's uh, being used by the, by the uh, French. It's um, rated in, as far as I know, in Spanish reals, and uh, it's, it's written in French. Here's the letter. Uh, you can see again, this is revolutionary references when it opens up by being addressed to citizen. Uh, the script is modern at this point, not the medieval script. And it, see, it mentions several countries. So I'm expecting it's a commercial letter talking about shipments or commerce uh, with other European countries through this addressee. In 1801, another consular letter, I, I have no, no uh, contents to this one. I suspect it's the earliest use of the Algiers consular marking, at least on something at, uh, that's sent as a letter. It's not a postal marking. It's merely an indication of the origin or the writer of the letter. It's addressed to uh, citizen Ganthome, who ferried Napoleon from Egypt to France in 1799, which really wasn't his only claim to fame. You'll see more in a moment. There's a faint red alicant marking that indicates it went through Spain. And the lower left consular marking is the French consul at Alicant. So we have two indications that it went through there. I am guessing that the 15 is decimes uh, collected from the recipient in Toulon. So more about the addressee, since I don't know who wrote the letter. But Honoré Ganthome, who lived from 1755 to 1818, had quite a career of public service. Uh, he served in the American War of Independence. He was uh, at sea in the French Navy and served against the uh, British, Spanish, and, uh, and in Egypt and the Mediterranean. In 1801, he was in Toulon, and in 1802, he was appointed as the maritime prefect for Toulon. So he reached very responsible positions in the French uh, bureaucracy. This is another piece of consular mail. This one was written on one germinal year 10, which was 1802. You can see it was disinfected and uh, slit as well, a big gash across the front of the letter. And I'll show you the interior in a moment that shows you how effectively the uh, outside discoloration agent, whatever it was, vinegar or gas, uh, got to the inside. Again, it's addressed to the commissioner of, of uh, commissioner of health in Marseille, and the VDMP Voie de Mer par Toulon uh, marking was relatively uncommon on Algerian mail, but here's an early use of that. You can see it was sealed with the consular seal on the back this time, and look at the color of the paper on the inside. However they disinfected it, the disinfecting agent did not discolor the inside. I find it interesting that there's a reference to both uh, 
being written in uh, by the revolutionary calendar. But when you look down in the second to the last line there, it says via a letter by your letter of the 11th of March recently or the last, most recent March 11th. So they refer to both calendars in this letter, even though it's official correspondence during the time of the First Republic. Here's the, the uh, signature of the author. The consul at the time was Dubois Tainville. Uh, he served for quite some time in Algiers and some of his correspondence does survive. And he refers to the plague in his postscript uh, and saying that in Iran, three to four people are dying every day. Here's another uh, letter from 1804 from the same gentleman, the same consul. He's warning of a yellow fever outbreak this time in Gibraltar and that the ship's passengers were ill. The day He's ticked off at the day of Algiers because he's gone to him and said, hey, we need to quarantine because of yellow fever. And the day he says, nah, I, don't, I don't really care. I think it was one of the Allah will take care of us sort of responses. Uh, you see the, it's hard to tell, but at the very top of the letter, there's a long slip, and that was presumably how they chose to disinfect this letter. He's, I've, I've interpreted the word that we'll see on the next page as sending this in quadruplicate. You can see up in the up right below where I have the header 1804, it says quadruplicate, which I translated as uh, quadruplicate into English. So he sends it however many. He sends several versions of the letter in hopes that at least one will arrive at its destination. And he's added a postscript again to this letter about more yellow fever and his concern at both Bonn and at Oran. Here's the third and final use of the RGL marking. I don't own the second one, but there's no reason to particularly. Um, this is 1807. And it was a letter again addressed from Algiers to Marseille. This time it went through Bayonne on the Atlantic coast. So uh, that's the, the uh, transit mark in the upper right. And the 15 day seams is collected from the recipient. And I am expecting that this was a vinegar disinfectant just because of the coloration around the edges of the letter. It may have been dipped as part of a batch that it didn't reach all the way through. I just don't know. Here's the interior of the letter. It's a business letter. And I believe what it says is there's a person who left for the town of Bougie and put the writer in charge of his belongings. And he's seeking permission to release those belongings to somebody else so that he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. 1809, another consular letter. This is from a gentleman named Raganu La Chene. I'm My French is terrible. Uh, and I'm sure everybody in France will agree with that. Again, it's talking about the plague, this time in Smyrna. And it talks about how it took 70 days to get from Smyrna to Algiers, crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, I looked this guy up on the web. I think he is a, um, a French author. I don't know how well known he is in France, but I had never heard of him before. Here's the backside. You can see now that we're out of the, the uh, First Republic and we're into uh, the First Empire under Napoleon. So they've changed the consular seal. Here's another use of the VDMP Toulon marking. This is a personal letter written in 1810 to his, from a man in, in Algiers to his brother-in-law in Marseille. He talks about how the French consul has left, but he doesn't know where he went to. And it's a mere five day seams postage due because it took a fairly direct route to get where it was going. This one is an 1810 letter from the British consul, Henry Stanford, Staniford Blankley, to his son, I believe, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Isn't that sweet? It's five days, uh, five shillings postage due. And I 
think it's a three shillings 11 crossed out. And I'm, I don't understand the British rates uh, well enough to interpret that other than to assume that by virtue of going through Lisbon, and you can see the blue Lis Lisboa marking on there and dated 1810, uh, that, that the 311 may have been to get it to Lisbon and the five got it to Canada, I'm just not sure. So this is more about the blank, I call them the Blankleys. Yeah, Blankleys. So the writer was the British consul from 1806 to 1812. The letter was 1810. His daughter, Elizabeth Broughton, wrote a memoir later on that provided a lot of information about Blanky's time as the British consul. His main job was trying to get British nationals redeemed out of slavery. And uh, she points out that it was a job that cost him money. He didn't make money because uh, he was many times forced to pay the ransom out of his own funds. The recipient, his son, I could not find specifically on the web. However, um, the 23rd Regiment of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers is pretty famous. It was formed in eight, 1689. It was designated as Royal Fusiliers in 1714. It was in the American War of Independence and had been sent to Nova Scotia after being in Martinique during one of the times when the British and the French were fighting about control of Martinique. So in early 1816, the British decided they're tired again of the, the privateers in Algiers. So they send Lord Exmouth down with a fleet and he, uh, he bombs the, bombards the Algerians. The, the day agrees that he's going to protect all the Christians. And after Exmouth leaves with this understanding, what happens? But the Algerian troops proceed to massacre 200 Sicilians, Cor Corsicans, and Sardinians, but they were under British care. So Lord Exmouth gets ordered by the Prince Regent to go back to Algiers and make sure that the day gets the message the second time. On August 27th, 1816, Exmouth bombarded Algiers again. Eight hours of shelling by 40 gunboats. The largest ship on site was uh, HMS Queen Charlotte. It, we think it was the most powerful ship in the English Navy at the time. They fired over 50,000 rounds into Algiers. And if you look at the painting here, just in the middle above the, the blast on the water, you can see the hilltop where the buildings of Algiers sh show how they climb up that hill. And here's a letter written in the harbor of Algiers on September 2nd, just a few days after the bombardment sent to London by a gentleman named Abraham Salome. Uh, I think it went to T. Boozy. It may have been to J. Boozy. I can't read his handwriting very well, but it's rated one shilling, um, yeah, one shilling, 10 pence, which is one shilling packet letter rate plus 11 pence for the 220 mile inland transit. And how do I know that? I'll show you in a moment, less, a one penny abatement by a GPO, uh, general post office notice dated July 1812. And how did I learn that? Because several Brits helped me greatly. Martin Greer, Peter Kellen, Kelly and Colin, Colin Tabor all did a nice job of assisting me in understanding the postal rates. Here's the postal markings on the back side, the 220 being the distance from Plymouth Docks into London. And then there's a London uh, transit mark on December, or sorry, October 7th. Here's the writer, Abraham Salome. He was an Egyptian Christian and he was Exmouth's interpreter when Exmouth went back in August, 1816. His letter describes the battle and the terms of agreement with the day. And in 1819, he actually wrote a book about it uh, the first half of the book being his story and the second half of the book, and I mean it's about half and half, about the battle and the negotiations with the Day of Algiers. 
I just received a, an author's proof of the article that I wrote for the London Philatelist, which any of you who are royal members will see in the October edition. So I look forward to that being published. All right, in 1819, oh, and I was able to buy Salome's book on eBay. Can you imagine? So I actually have his original 1819 book sitting in my library now, which was just wonderfully serendipitous after I found this letter. 1819, a Guernsey letter, a brother writing to his sisters, and it appears that he's on a voyage where he was just kind of sent off as part of growing up. Later on, the writer became a colonel in the British army, I assume. I don't know if there's colonels in the Navy. Uh, the letter was rooted through Portsmouth. You can see a very faint Portsmouth marking on the, the face of the letter. It's rated one shilling, eight pence. And you can see how the, the uh, rate was achieved. And uh, one of the gentlemen, David Gurney or Alan Moorcroft, described the route through England to get uh, back to back on a ship to get to Guernsey. Here's the uh, the dateline, if you will, from the inside of the lever letter. HM ship Tagus running into Algiers on the 19th of May, 1819. Uh, the guy's father was an admiral in the navy. The writer if I have the right guy identified, is the, was born in 1806, and he became the third baron of Salmarez. He rambles in his letter. He talks more about, boy, I hope you guys are having fun, and I miss you so much, and so on, and makes very few remarks about what he's actually doing. He's 13 years old, so that sort of explains why his mind was going the way it was. The best picture I could find of the HMS Tagus is the postage stamp from the Pitcairn Islands down below. It's the ship on the right. And uh, it's on that stamp because the Tagus had been in the Pitcairn Islands in 1814. An 1826 consular letter. Now we're getting close to the time of the French invasion. Pierre Duval is now the consul. He sent this letter via the Corvette Hollandaise, you can see, uh, named the Curacao. The captain, I think, is Cushin, C-U-S-H-I-N, but I'm not sure of that. And his first name, I believe, is Stefan. The QDC is, uh, again, whom God preserves. So it's a hope that God will look after the captain because he's carrying this letter to the uh, Public Health Commission in, in uh, Marseille again. Here, Duval describes how a ship was seized by the Barbary pirates when it was on its way to Gibraltar. Uh, there was no yellow fever aboard. And Duval is the consul who was insulted by the day and ultimately provided the reason for the French to invade in 1830. So somewhere along the line, I found an auction house in Paris that had a document dated, as you can see, June 23rd, 1829. And it's a summary of all the complaints France has against Algiers. It's about a dozen pages long. It's very neatly written. Um, I was able to translate parts of it quite easily just by typing it into Google Translate. It notes that Hussein Pasha became the day in 1818. He'd been kind of a jerk to try and get along with him. And this then goes through the treaty violations, the violation of diplomatic rules and the way the consul's been treated in France. And in uh, 1827, following the insult, which we'll see a picture of in a moment, uh, France blockaded Algiers and Hussein Pasha kind of didn't care. So the blockade had not changed his behavior. And I think this may have been written to justify considering an invasion of Algiers. So here's Hussein Pasha from an engraving that was taken out of a book published sometime thereafter. Looks like a nice enough guy, doesn't he? But here is when he insulted Duval. 
There was a discussion about debt because the French had borrowed from the Algerian Turks to help fund one of their military ventures. Uh, they had decided not to pay the debt back or wanted to pay it back for less money. And Pasha was so, in, so incensed that he struck the consul with his fly whisk, as you can see in this picture. They started the blockade and it had no effect. So in 1830, Charles X decided for a couple of reasons, one of which was the army is getting restless here at home. I need to find something for them to do. And because of the insult in 1827, on June 15, 1830, he sent his army off across the Mediterranean. They landed just west of Algiers and then uh, began their occupation that didn't end until Algerian independence in 1962. But that's for another day. So there we are. Now it's time for you to ask questions or tell me what I got wrong. Please remember to unmute and I will stop screen sharing so we can see each other. There we go. Nobody. You look like you're mostly awake. <laughs> Ken? Yes. That was fantastic. Oh, thank I you. I thoroughly Jeff. enjoyed that. Um, you. Will you uh, do much um, of Algeria under the French in the future, or is that your natural stopping point? Actually, I have a postal history collection that goes through March 31st, 1876, the end of the classical period. So I have more. Okay. You want to tell us about them at a subsequent time? I'm most happy to. I've, I've actually done a great. presentation uh, to the Collectors Club of New York on it, and uh, I believe Collectors Club of Chicago as well. Um, it's interesting that uh, their neighbor to the West, which is Morocco, uh, did not seem to have those problems. In fact, we were in Morocco and they um, have a, a museum to the first American consulate. And they were the first country to recognize the United States. And they're very proud of that. Yes. Um, they were just I've really been thinking. Yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, they're neighbors too. But that's what I find it unusual. Although today, even in my discussions, they don't like each other. The uh, Moroccans think of the Algerians as being uh, crazy, wild, and having communist uh, uh, leaning tensions. And the Algerians think the uh, Moroccans are just um, uh, monarchs, uh, monarchists, and, and uh, and a, a, a pay a pleasers. So they don't get along today even. No, Western puppets, the Moroccans, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd like to find somebody that knows a little bit about Moroccan uh, postal history. Oh, um, we have we have that man. And he did something on airmail for us a couple of months ago, Larry Gardner in northern Indiana. Oh wow. He's a great student of Moroccan postal history. I may try to get in touch with him then. By all means. Um, Great presentation, Ken. I've got to go. All right. Thanks, Joe. Anybody else? Ken, that was, a, that was a great presentation. I learned a lot out of that. Well, thank you, Steve. It is an unusual period, and I was surprised when I submitted my article for the London philatelist that the editor wrote back and he said, you know, this really is fun because not many of the British even know about this uh, activity in North Africa. So uh, I don't know, Ken, can you hear me? I can, Steve. Um, have you come across any correspondence 
you know, Thomas Jefferson sent a, a fleet to uh, uh, subdue the uh, Barbary pirates during his term of office. Have you come across any correspondence during that period with the United States? I have not, and I suspect if there is any, it's more likely going to be somebody who's interested in Tunisia because that's the, the shores of Tri Tripoli in the Marine Hymn. So, right. So Did that, you? Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, do you have any references that help decipher some of the penmanship? Uh, I, do, I do not. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, collecting old French uh, stampless covers and, and letters and, and trying to translate them. So some of the penmanship is easy and some of it is rather challenging. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't have a, uh, an acquaintance who can read the uh, French or the medieval script. Uh, Ken, Ed, Ed Grabowski here. I, I just have to tell one story. It is Algerian, so, so I, can, I can tell it today. Uh, and it's relative to translation. Uh, back uh, when I was collecting France, I bought this letter uh, that went from uh, uh, Tlemcen in Algeria to Alger, uh, to, to Algiers, uh, 1854, five or six. Uh, franked with a 20 centime Napoleon with a proper small letter, small number cancellation. And it was written in Hebraic script. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is a simple thing. You know, there are lots of people uh, who can who can read Hebraic script. And so very, very naively, I, I got in touch with our, our local rabbi uh, at the temple. And he said he indeed confirmed it was Hebraic script, but he couldn't read a word of it. Uh, he said, however, he had a good friend at Hebrew Union College in New York, and I should go see him, and he could probably read it. So I brought it to the Hebrew Union College in, in New York to that friend and showed him the letter, and, and he pondered it for a, a while. And he said, well, indeed, is, it is Hebraic script, uh, but it's written in a very uh, uh, limited or, or, or a strange Arabic dialect. I, I can only read a few words of this. Uh, he said, however, there are three people in the world who can read it. And, and uh, one was at <laughs> uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook, and the other two were in Israel. So I sent the letter to the fellow at Stony Brook and never heard from him. Uh, and then I, I sent it to the first fellow in, in uh, Israel. And about two weeks later, I got a wonderful response with the full translation. Uh, he noted it was a very, very unusual Arab dialect. Nothing exceptional in my letter. It was a commercial letter uh, between two brothers. And, and they commented about uh, the prices of goods and the local political situations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was very, very nice to get a full translation. Uh, and the fellow in, in Israel asked if I would help him get a book uh, that he was having trouble getting and, and importing into Israel. And I got it, went into New York to um, uh, the big bookstore, The Strand, and, and, and I got the book and I sent it to him as a gift. And he was very, very pleased with that. The other thing that he noted uh, uh, given my last name, um, he said that the, the, uh, the Jewish people uh, in their travels around the world are often uh, first, the first ones to record history of a region. And the first recorded history uh, for Poland uh, is, is in the 11th century, and it's all in Hebrew. It was done by the, by the, by the local Jews. So it was a, it was a wonderful adventure. And uh, I did get my translation, and, and uh, the gist of my story is I would encourage all of you who have these old letters and unusual scripts, maybe unusual languages, uh, keep after it and find the experts. They exist. Yep. I have several letters probably written in that same Arabic dialect of Hebrew. Mm-hmm. 
And I did have somebody at one time offer to try and translate that first letter, the 1597 letter. And uh, I corresponded with him two or three times and he just never got around to it. He had some personal item, personal matters come up that prevented it. So I've been disappointed in my attempts to have somebody tell me what that letter is about. Well, you just gotta find the right people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. Maybe somebody at the University of Milan, if there is such a thing. Quite possibly. Okay. Well, any more? If not, we are scheduled to do this again in October, and I am embarrassed that I cannot remember who is speaking. Uh, but I believe we have speakers lined up for uh, October, November, and January. I'm not sure about December. Uh, and one of them is going to be uh, Clemens Albert, who lives in Bavaria, and he will speak to us in English um, about New Hebrides. And one of them is... Uh, Mike Bass, who will be talking about the French uh, postal history in Holy Land. So I know we have at least two coming up. All right. If there's nothing else, I will adjourn us for this afternoon. And I thank all of you for your attention and participation. And we will do this again in a month. Thank you, Ken. Okay, bye-bye. You're very welcome. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting talk. Thank you.